Today we will talk about the medical evaluation for persistent or recurrent psychotic disorders. The DSM-5, as well as previous versions of the DSM, have consistently stated that schizophrenia cannot be diagnosed if the symptoms are better attributed to the effects of drugs or drug withdrawal, or if the symptoms arise from a medical condition. So the DSM implicitly requires that a medical evaluation be performed if a diagnosis of schizophrenia is to be valid. However, the DSM does not give very much guidance about the specific nature of the medical evaluation, and in fact, specific guidance on medical tests are remarkably difficult to come by. Several national, professional, or practice guidance organizations have published some guidelines regarding medical tests for patients with new onset of schizophrenia-like symptoms. You'll notice from this table, however, that there is not universal agreement on the recommended medical tests. Also, the number of recommended tests is surprisingly short when one considers the list of possible diseases that can cause schizophrenia-like symptoms. And I will also mention that it's increasingly accepted that inflammatory or autoimmune diseases are widely known to cause schizophrenia-like psychosis as a presenting or prominent symptom, yet in none of these national practice guidelines do we see any recommendations for testing for inflammation or autoimmune disease. I will also just point out that the most comprehensive of these guidelines come from the Canadian Psychiatric Association and the American Psychiatric Association, and both of these organizations recommend, sim recommend just seven um, blood tests as obligatory, with four additional blood tests um, suggested if they are indicated. And just to give you an idea of how many medical conditions can cause schizophrenia-like symptoms, I've compiled what I think is only a partial list of diseases known to produce psychotic symptoms. Uh, this list contains 54 different disease entities, so it seems likely that we would have to deploy more than seven blood tests in order to rule them out. Every patient with new onset psychotic symptoms deserves a very complete medical workup. Not only is getting the correct diagnosis as early as possible part of our job, it's also a moral obligation that we have to provide an accurate diagnosis to ensure that no treatable or preventable alternate cause of psychosis is missed. Getting an accurate diagnosis should be entirely sufficient just by itself to justify intensive laboratory or imaging investigations. But in an era where most treatment decisions are governed by financial considerations, it's also important to point out that schizophrenia is an extremely expensive disease. Estimates of one year of care are around $26,000 per year per patient. So if we rescue just one out of 100 individuals from a schizophrenia diagnosis and we can give them a curative treatment, we will probably have saved the system well over a million dollars in lifetime costs if we factor in the um, $26,000 per year um, of unnecessary medication for a chronic illness. Doing a complete medical workup at the beginning of treatment will also ensure that our patients have a baseline with which to gauge the progress of illness or the presence of side effects. And we should also recall that many of our patients will come to us without the benefit of regular medical care. So screening for chronic and treatable illnesses in this um, cohort of individuals is uh, certainly worthwhile. Most of the arguments against doing a full-scale comprehensive medical evaluation boil down to arguments that it's the physician's job to save money for the insurance company. These arguments make sense if you're the manager of a large organization. The ethical case for rationing screening is that more money is left over to treat other people with illness. On the other hand, I've taken care of some of the young children of insurance company executives, and I can tell you that those individuals uh, wish that no expense be spared or that no stone be unturned when it comes to trying to find a medical explanation for psychotic symptoms for their children.
and I don't recall that saving money for an insurance company is something that is in the Hippocratic Oath. In other words, our primary duty is to relieve suffering, and our primary duty should be to our patients, the, the one that we have before us who is with the symptoms. We owe it to them to make sure that every possible explanation for their symptoms has been investigated and properly ruled out which is to restate that patients deserve an accurate diagnosis and the only way to get definitively helpful treatment is to be entirely certain about the validity of the diagnosis that guides said treatment. And the argument that we shouldn't do a full-scale medical workup for every case of classic uh, schizophrenia-like presentation rests on the idea that these medical look-alikes of schizophrenia-like symptoms are rare entities and so that we will be doing a lot of testing to find a very few people with alternate diagnoses. And that argument then depends upon the assumption that such medical illnesses are in fact rare. But that is not what the data shows. Uh, studies of cohorts of individuals with either first episode psychosis or with established schizophrenia um, show that medical diseases which are causative of the psychotic symptoms may be as high as 10% in some samples. Uh, and certainly the presence of medical conditions that exacerbate symptoms uh, may be even higher, as high as 20% in some estimates. So the illnesses are there, but we're not going to detect them unless we go looking for them, and that will require more than doing a CBC and basic chemistry panel. The starting point for medical evaluation of persistent or recurrent psychosis is a physical exam and a neurological exam, and both of these exams must be comprehensive and complete. Um, physical exam initially should also include um, height, weight, and body mass index um, in order to uh, set a baseline with which to establish, the, uh, with which to gauge the occurrence of metabolic side effects or changes down the road. We will now look at specific laboratory tests that should be part of a new onset schizophrenia workup or part of the workup for treatment resistant symptoms or the workup that occurs with significant changes to the clinical picture. The starting point is a set of tests which most clinicians will consider basic with new admissions or new intakes. Those include CBC with differential, um, a set of uh, metabolic tests oftentimes grouped under the category comprehensive metabolic panel and a TSH. So nothing really unusual there and these tests are in line with those in the slide I showed you, showed you earlier from the American Psychiatric Association recommended panel of initial tests. We've spoken before about the very important role for inflammation in the expression of psychotic symptoms, and we've also in previous lectures touched upon the fact that several autoimmune diseases can present with schizophrenia-like symptoms. So in this slide, we look at laboratory tests that go beyond those recommended by the national practice organizations, um, and we turn to inflammatory and autoimmune diseases. The first three items on the list, C-reactive protein, sedimentation rate, and ferritin, will serve as broad screens for the presence of inflammation. And the remaining items on this list, antinuclear antibody, thyroid peroxidase antibody, tissue transglutaminase, and the Mayo encephalopathy panel are screens for autoimmune diseases that are known to present with schizophrenia-like symptoms. And it's well known that syphilis as well as HIV can present with psychosis and therefore they should be screened for. Um, there are also a variety of vitamin deficiencies that can cause psychosis and screening for them is fast and inexpensive and when present, repletion can be curative of the psychotic symptoms. And heavy metals do exist. Uh, the story of Flint, Michigan should um, help us to understand that and it's worthwhile initially to screen for heavy metal um, toxicity in new onset cases or in um, cases with treatment resistance or unusual clinical signs. And finally, I'll just uh, remind folks that Wilson's disease is real and that Wilson's disease uh, can present with psychosis and it's easy to at least screen for it initially by looking at copper and ceruloplasmin levels.
Your analysis can be extremely informative about the physiological state of the body and therefore should be included in the initial, in the initial workup. Uh, urine drug screen will be included by most clinicians doing initial workups, um, but it's important to recall or to remember that many drugs of abuse that are popular these days are typically not screened for in urine drug screens. Ketamine would be an example and several um, designer drugs would fall into that category. And next, I will strongly assert that imaging studies should be done in every new case. Uh, imaging studies should include a chest x-ray um, that can detect entities like sarcoidosis or cancers, and indeed sarcoidosis and cancers have been shown to be present in cohorts of first episode psychosis patients. Um, it's a common misunderstanding that brain imaging is not necessary unless there are so-called neurological symptoms that are present. This guidance seems to ignore the fact that psychosis is itself a neurological symptom. Psychosis typically emerges from dysfunction in the frontal cortex, the temporal cortex, or the cingulate gyrus. And people can have tumors, strokes, calcifications, or any number of structural lesions in these regions of the brain without them registering as deficits in sensation, movement, or coordination. The brain regions, in other words, that give rise to psychosis belong to the semantically curious property of neurologically silent regions. So just because a patient doesn't have disorders of sensation, movement, or coordination doesn't mean that they don't have a tumor, a stroke, a cyst, or some other pathology in temporal cortex, parietal cortex, cingulate gyrus, or frontal lobe. Uh, imaging studies should be done because psychosis is a neurological symptom and psychosis is an indication for looking at the brain. And a couple of notes on a couple of autoimmune diseases with psychosis as, as a presentation. One of them being NMDA receptor encephalitis. This is increasingly recognized as a cause of new onset psychosis. The true prevalence of NMDA receptor encephalitis in first episode cohorts is still being worked out. Um, it may be as few as 1% of cases. In some estimates, the antibodies at least are present in 6% of new onset cases. Antibody screening costs about $100, and if it leads to a diagnosis of NMDA receptor encephalitis, um, this will require an entirely different treatment plan, so it's worthwhile to screen for. Another relatively common autoimmune condition is Hashimoto's encephalopathy. In this condition, schizophrenia-like psychosis arises as part of antithyroid autoimmunity. Again, an um, antibody screening is inexpensive. If Hashimoto's encephalopathy is detected, psychotic symptoms will typically resolve with a course of steroid treatment and patients will not require long-term antipsychotic medications. So again, another example of a relatively inexpensive test, which can lead to a radically different treatment course than that which is typically offered to people that are um, diagnosed with schizophrenia. To summarize, Medical diseases causing schizophrenia-like psychosis are relatively common. Perhaps as many as 10% of individuals initially thought to have schizophrenia will prove to have a non-psychiatric disease as the cause of their schizophrenia-like symptoms. Therefore, a comprehensive medical evaluation must be offered to every patient experiencing the new onset of psychosis. It's also worthwhile to review medical workup in cases of antipsychotic medication non-response or in cases where there has been a significant change in the clinical picture. It is vital to pay attention to any abnormal physical finding or to any abnormal laboratory finding. Um, even if those abnormalities seem borderline or initially potentially trivial. Um, we must follow up every abnormality until a medically satisfactory explanation has been offered for those abnormalities. We owe it to our patients to give them an accurate diagnosis, and the way to do that is to be systematic and diligent in the search for medical abnormalities.